Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Learners. Welcome to the session of managerial economics. I am Dr. Supriya Jain working as an assistant professor in the Institute of Business Management at GLA University, Mathura. Let us look at the topics which we have covered yesterday. In our yesterday's session, we have talked particularly about demand forecasting. As we all know, forecasting our demand is very important because it gives answer to the many questions how much to produce, how we are going to make necessary arrangements required for the production. So for the, all that reason, we have understood what demand forecasting is and we have also seen before we go ahead with demand forecasting, we need to understand what level of forecasting we are going with, right. So the categorization first we do for demand forecasting based on the level. It can be done at individual level, at firm level, industry level or it can be done at economic level. So those different levels we have discussed and whatever the level we are choosing accordingly we will be choosing our methodology. Then it can be done for the time period also before you forecast the demand you should be clear with the time period whether you are forecasting the demand for the longer period of time or you are forecasting it for a shorter period of time. Usually the year up to two years would be considered to be a shorter period of forecasting and besides that if you are forecasting then it would be considered to be a long term forecasting. And then we have also seen the nature of goods imp uh, plays a very important role in demand forecasting consideration for what type of commodity are you forecasting whether your product is of capital nature or it is a consumer good. So again your target audience will be different and the opinion and the interview and the questions which you are going to ask from those people will be different right. Thereafter we have seen the significance that is the importance of demand forecasting. Yes, it is very important because demand forecasting will help the managers to make uh, you know effective and successful planning for the business. They can make their productions according to the demand to overcome the situation of overproduction and underproduction. Right, uh, firm can make necessary arrangements of finance also. They can use various uh, marketing or promotional strategies to you know enhance the demand of the product in the market. It can also help in evaluating the performance. So all these things are uh, required. For all these things, demand forecasting has been required. Right. Thereafter, we have also seen the criteria, the important aspects which are need to be taken into consideration while choosing the method for the demand forecasting. Like uh, what is more important for you, right? Uh, accuracy, the results which you are going to get from that method, right? How much that method is economical? What kind of cost it is going to involve? Maintenance of timeliness, right? Whether you will be able to get your results within time or not? How much you can rely on the results, right? How much flexibility that method is going to provide you because it is going to be done for the future and you never know what kind of changes you need to incorporate. So how flexible it is, right? So these were the aspects which you need to take into consideration before you choose any demand forecasting method and then we have seen the steps how we start with this demand forecasting process, right? How we are going to, uh, you know, decide our objective first and we need to analyze the different determinants of the demand, uh, what is the nature of the commodity, then we need to uh, find out the right uh, method of selecting this demand forecasting and the results which we are getting out of it, we need to interpret those results, right? So there are certain, uh, you know, steps which you need to follow to forecast the demand of your commodity. And then we have talked about the method, the most important aspect through which we can forecast the demand. So here we have talked about, uh, you know, qualitative and quantitative methods for demand forecasting. And the qualitative methods are usually those methods which are being taken up to forecast the demand for the products which are new to the market or where we do not have the past data available to us. And usually the qualitative methods are used for forecasting the demand for the shorter period of time. Whereas quantitative methods are those methods which are more suitable and which are more uh, which, which gives you better results yes for sure because they are based on some tools and techniques right and here we analyze those things in a mathematical consideration 
Okay, and here we usually forecast the demand for the longer period and the products which are already there in the market for which we are having the time series data available to us. For that reason, the results are also better drawn with this qualitative uh, quantitative methods, right? And lastly, we have seen the limitations of demand forecasting. While conducting or while forecasting the demand, there are certain problems uh, which a firm goes through like uh, time is again one consideration, money is a consideration, like uh, we could take expert advice, but we do not find uh, those expertise people in our market, right? We are not able to get that much of data which has been required for the forecasting of demand. So, there are different kind of problems. Uh, you know, an organization has to face while forecasting the demand. So, those were discussed in our previous lecture. So, completely we can say we have talked about demand forecasting starting with what it is and what problems we are facing while forecasting the demand. So, now let us start with our today's lecture and here in this lecture we are going to talk about consumer preferences and choices, right? How do consumer make out their choices? and how but they are revealing their preferences. So, that is what we are going to cover in our today's lecture and let us look at the learning objective of our session. So, initially you will be introduced to the crux of consumer behavior because as we know economics is a study of how consumer behave, right? Because it is very important to know how consumer are behaving and how they are making their decisions because ultimately everything in the economy based on consumer behavior because it is a social science. So, how consumer will behave, what choices are they making and what preferences are they giving to the products and this will also help you to explain the nuances of utility analysis, right? Because consumer whatever the purchase they are making, they need to get the satisfaction out of it because if they are not getting that satisfaction, they will not purchase that commodity, right? So, utility is basically the power of uh, you know making the consumer satisfied, how much they are being satisfied with that commodity. So, that nuances of utility analysis you will be able to understand here with the concept of marginal utility, what is total utility and here we will also talk about law of diminishing marginal utility as well as law of equi marginal utility. Thereafter in this uh, lecture you will be able to differentiate between cardinal and ordinal utility. These are the two important measures through which we can uh, you know measure the utility concept which are given by different economists. So, you will get to know the difference between cardinal and ordinal utility to analyze the consumer behavior. Thereafter, we will talk about consumer equilibrium, consumer equilibrium like we have talked about market equilibrium, uh, equilibrium is a state of balance. When market is in equilibrium, we say that demand and supply is equals. Right? When aggregate demand of the economy is equals to the aggregate supply, then we say that our economy is in equilibrium. So, same here we will talk about the consumer equilibrium, how consumer will reach up to the state of their equilibrium position where their income and the uh, you know utility they are deriving out of the consumption of all the commodities will be same. So, that consumer equilibrium we will be discussing here and we will also talk about the budget constraint because we have already understood that resources are limited. So, here the budget, the income of a person is a constraint, is a limited uh, thing. Accordingly, we are going to divide our uh, you know consumption of commodities. So, as maximum utility can be derived out of it. And lastly, you will be able to understand the concept of revealed preference theory. Revealed preference theory will help you to understand how consumer will reveal their preferences and based on this theory, how are they making their choices. So, these will be the learning objective of our today's session. So, let us begin with the very first point where we are going to understand the consumer choices. Now, to understand the consumer choices as you know that consumer have a different kind of taste and preferences and to understand the taste and preferences of the consumer we have to make certain assumption like in economics we have various laws okay we have various theories but these theories are only applicable with certain assumptions so again for understanding the consumer choice and to understand uh, the relative aspect of this cardinal ordinal as well as revealed preference theory you need to understand these three points very clearly right so, the very first point here is talking about completeness, 
right what does that means see completeness is one assumption which we are making that the consumer is clear about their choices right consumer is consistent about uh, you know their choices that means if there are two products suppose we have two products one is product a and the other one is product b and if a consumer is uh, preferring product a over b right so consumer is preferring product a and uh, product a over b that means the consumer will always prefer product a over b or consumer prefer product b over a so com com uh, consumer is basically consistent in their choices and whatever the choices they are making they are having a complete clarity of the choice that what product they are preferring are they preferring a over b or they are preferring b over a or the consumer is indifferent between these two product either a or b right there is no difference between the consumption of commodity a or commodity b consumer is indifferent among these two consumption of commodities or a consumer have a clarity about whether the consumer is going to prefer a over b or b over a right so this is what basically this assumption says which is known at completeness right or this can also be called as consistent Compu consumer is always consistent about making their choices now coming to the second assumption we have this transitivity now transitivity is just a step ahead of this assumption where we are saying that if a consumer is preferring a over b uh, right and is also preferring b over c right so here we are taking three commodities if a consumer is preferring a over b and b over c then if a consumer has to make a choice between a and c then definitely they will prefer a over c right so this is what transitivity says transitivity says consumer are clear with their preferences they are having this consistency that which product they are uh, preferring over the another product and they keep their preferences consistent and accordingly only they are behaving so these are some assumptions which we are trying to understand to uh, you know know the behavior pattern of a consumer what uh, behavior they are showing okay so first is completeness where we have seen uh, the relationship between two commodities which commodity consumer is preferring or if the consumer is indifferent among these two commodities then then next principle is going to apply it similarly right and if we have three commodities where a is being preferred over b and b is being preferred over c then in that case if a consumer has to make a choice between a and c then definitely consumer will prefer a or you can say that if a consumer is indifferent between a and b and b and c then if there is a choice between a and c then consumer will be indifferent between a and c he can choose either a or he can choose either b right so these are the assumption for the consumer behavior we are making here now look at the third uh, you know uh, assumptions we have written here that is non satiation right what does that mean non satiation as a consumer right consumer is a person who is never ever satisfied right they always look for more and more if some uh, something of good is better uh, good is uh, better than more of uh, that particular commodity is much better right so if you are having something uh, in quantity 1 and somebody is offering you the another quantity definitely you will be happy to have this because a consumer is having that kind of spirit where they are never satisfied and they are always looking for more and more of the things right they will always prefer uh, you know if there is a choice between two consumption basket of one pizza and two pizza then definitely consumer will prefer to have two pizzas right okay so this is how we try to understand the consumer choices based on these assumption and these assumptions are very important for a further discussions of the concept like ordinal utility and revealed preference theory so now let us move ahead to understand the concept of utility right how consumer are making choices and how they are behaving those assumptions we have studied now what is meant by utility like i said utility is a satisfaction uh, given to the person right the, the, the satisfaction they are deriving out of the consumption of any commodity is known as utility this basically notion given by jeremy bentham and he has coined this term utility and it is the satisfaction of a consumer that derives out of the consumption of a commodity right or you can say that it is an attribute of a commodity to satisfy or satiate right 
you can also call it as a satiation or the satisfaction which a consumer is drawing out of the consumption of that commodity. So, that is how we define the concept of utility. Now, we can also frame out this utility function right like we have demand function, we have schedule function like utility is function of what right. So, if we are establishing this mathematically we can say that utility is a function of uh, the commodities which you are consuming right. So, here we have written utility is the function of m1, n1 and r1 and what is this m1? m1 is the quantity of commodity m quantity of commodity n is the n1 and quantity of commodity r is the r1 right. Whatever the quantity you have consume of those commodities, uh, it is the combination of those commodities after consuming them what utility you have derived out of it, here you can express uh, expressing it in terms of utility function right. So, utility function and be written like this based on the different consumption of goods ok. Now, moving ahead you can see that a rational consumer, a rational consumer as we all know is a person who is always making a choice between the cost and the benefit right and is also making a decision where benefits are higher than the cost. So, being a rational consumer we always aims at maximizing our utility from the consumption of different com uh, commodities subject to the budget constraint. Now, you can see here we are talking about actually the thing which we have started initially with the limited resources how we are going to satisfy our maximum needs and wants. So, limited resource here is the income right the budget which we are having. So, how we are going to utilize our income or how we are distributing this income to the consumption of different commodities where we would be able to satisfy our maximum needs and wants and this we can do when we are behaving rationally, we are making rational decisions, analyzing each and every aspect of it and finding it out where we can have a maximum satisfaction right. So, looking ahead now let us look at the concept of utility more clearly with these two theories one is called as cardinal utility and the other one is called as ordinal utility right. These are the two important theories which are given in this utility consideration for its calculation. So, we will start first with this cardinal utility. This cardinal utility concept is given by Alfred Marshall right. He is the person who has uh, you know understood this concept and uh, bring, to, uh, bring, uh, bring to our, our notice that uh, utility can be measured as per Alfred Marshall cardinal utility says that we can assign numbers of util to any commodity whatever commodity we are consuming right we can find out what kind of satisfaction we are deriving out of it ok what, what utility we have received out of the consumption of that commodity and that utility can be expressed in uh, unit and the unit for measuring that is known as utils ok like we have other measurement units like we have kilogram like we have weight right uh, we can measure weight in kilograms same way utility can be measured in the unit called as utils right. So, further Marshall says that utility is additive right you can also add the utility it is not that only you can find out the utility in numbers but it can also be added like for example here is a person right looking for a particular consumer if a consumer presume, uh, has consumed banana right and this banana gives him the satisfaction of two utils right and he has also taken mango and this mango gives him the satisfaction of three utils. So, all togetherly the total utility of this person will be equals to five utils three plus two what means we have added the utilities of these two products all togetherly and we have calculated the total utility of this consumer. Uh, you know for the, with the consumption of these two commodities for banana and mango right. So, this is what is cardinal concept telling us that cardinal utility says that utility can be measured and the measuring unit of utility known as util not only we can measure it, but yes we can also add it to find out the total utility of the consumer and this concept is given by Alfred Marshall and that is why this is also called as Marshallian theory right. Now, looking further to the concept of total and marginal utility what is meant by total utility and what is meant by marginal utility. 
total utility you can find out very easily the total utility which a person is deriving out of the consumption of any commodity and the aspect of total utility say as and when we keep on consuming any identity uh, you know any commodity the utility increases but yes it increases up to a point but thereafter the utility also stop increases but it will start decreasing that I will make you understand with different laws which we are going to take up further in this lecture as well. But for now you need to understand that total utility refers to the sum total of utility levels out of each unit of the commodity. Whatever the unit of commodity you have consumed, right? the total utility you have reached with the consumption within a given period of time would be considered to be as in total utility. Whereas marginal utility is the marginal utility is called as the total unit of one additional unit right the marginal utility you will be able to calculate one additional unit suppose you have taken one unit and then after one unit of that commodity when you have taken the second unit okay so the difference between the utility of first unit and the second unit would be considered to be as in marginal uti uh, utility right what extra utility you are going to get with the addition of one more unit would be considered as a mar uh, marginal utility. And here we have the uh, ways of calculating this marginal utility. The first way would be marginal utility is equals to total utility of n commodity minus total utility of n minus 1. 1 means one additional unit which you have taken up, right? If you will deduct it from that, that would be your marginal utility, right? And this is the another way of calculating, this is the another formula written to calculate the marginal utility itself, where we are saying change in total utility, right? Whatever the change is taking place in the total utility divided by the change in quantity, right? Then also you will be able to calculate marginal utility. Now how we are going to understand this concept of total and marginal utility more clearly? Let us look at the law where we are going to talk about law of diminishing marginal utility. This law of diminishing marginal utility says that as in when we keep on consuming any commodity, the marginal utility which we derive out of the consumption keeps on decreasing, right? So, law of diminishing marginal utility says marginal utility of every successive unit consumed goes on decreasing. And this is explained with a single commodity only. See, we are talking about uh, cardinal concept of utility. And as per the Marshall, cardinal utility of, uh, you know, cardinal concept of utility says that we can measure the utility. And to further understand this concept, we have two laws basically. One is law of diminishing marginal utility, utility which we are talking right now. And after this, we will talk about the another law, which is called as law of equi-marginal utility. So, this basically law of diminishing marginal utility is applicable for the consumption of one commodity at a time, right? So, if you look at the table, how we are expressing this, uh, you know, diminishing marginal utility as well as total utility. Here we have three columns. In the first column, we are talking about the cup of teas consumed per day. That is the quantity given here. And here in the second column, we have total utilities. And here we have in the third column the marginal utility and you can look at the formula. We can calculate it by change in the total utility upon change in the quantity. So when a person consume one cup of tea, the total utility derived after the consumption is 12, uh, 12 units, right, but which, is in, which is measured in utils. It is already written here. The measurement unit of utility is utils and the marginal utility will be same in the very first case, okay. So, marginal utility and total utility will be same in the very first case, but as and when a consumer keeps on increasing the quantity of this, uh, you know, uh, commodity, the consumption of cup of a tea, right, you can see that total utility is increasing, right, but at the point 6, you can see the total utility here is not increasing anymore, rather it has started declining. Whereas marginal utility in each successive case is decreasing. Initially it was 10 utils, then 10, then 8, then 6 and so on. But if you are not, uh, you know, continue uh, studying this, you can see that marginal utility can also be negative, right? 
So, it is actually not advisable to uh, you know consume the commodity up to the uh, after the point where it is not giving you any more satisfaction. So, it is always advisable for the person to have up to this much of uh, you know quantity of this uh, consumption of tea because adding more to it will not give any kind of a utility for that commodity right. So, if we will draw the graph of these uh, two uh, total utility and marginal utility we can see this is how we relate it. The first one is uh, showing you the expression of total utility right. So, here the total utility you can see initially it has increased, but after a point reached here it started declining right. So, this is basically the uh, satiation quantity which is written here beyond this point person should not consume that commodity whereas, the marginal utility curve is a declining curve which represent that it declines it keeps on decreasing as and when more and more commodities are being consumed for that commodity ok. And if you will continue the consumption it will reach to the negative as well right which is again not a thing to do or, or go ahead with the consumption of that commodity right. So, uh, if we look at the law of diminishing marginal utility assumption, this law what we are talking right now is again based on certain assumptions and without this assumption this law will not work right. So, what we are saying the first point says the unit of consumption must be a standard one that means the uh, you know commodity which we are consuming the cup or, or the size of a cup should remain the same. It should not be like if one sip of tea a person is taking right if we are calculating only the one sip of tea then it will not draw a right conclusion. We are talking about a cup of a tea which is of a standard size neither too short nor too uh, big right. So, it should be of a standard one then only the utility uh, will decline. Consumption must be continuous this is again important whatever you are consuming it should be consumed on a continuous basis because if you are making delay in your consumption or if you are taking that consumption after an interval right then definitely its utility will not diminish that consumption need to be taken at a point of a time. Multiple units of commodity should be consumed this law is applicable only on the consumption of those commodities which can be uh, you know consumed multiply. Uh, at a time right. If we talk about durable goods right this law is not going to be applicable on the durable goods because if you have purchased a car you are not going to purchase a car at the same time another car or maybe the car next day right. It, 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 it is a durable good right whereas, non durable goods like e tables which you can consume uh, you know all togetherly which are of recurring nature this law is applicable to those goods only. Then next we are saying that the taste and preference of the consumer should also remain unchanged yes for sure if you are talking about some commodity and a person is consuming that commodity the consumer keeps on consuming that commodity and see we have made that assumption earlier only that consumer are consistent in their choices there is a completeness there is a clarity of choices of uh, you know commodities which they are going to make and that remains same it, it should not be changed if it is suddenly going to change then again that concept is difficult for us to understand. And lastly we are saying that good should be a normal good it should not be an addictive good because in case of addictive goods might be possible that it, their utility will not decline because consumer is addictive to that commodity. So, the, these applications will not be possible in case of addictive goods right. So, here are the assumptions of law of diminishing marginal utility. So, basically with this law we have understood how we can measure the utility of any commodity which a consumer is consuming and we have seen that we can easily calculate it in terms of utils in the measurement unit which is been given by Alfred Marshall. But to make it clear to every one of you that this law of diminishing marginal utility is applicable for only one commodity at a time right. But if you look at in uh, you know practical sense there are uh, no people who are consuming only one commodity at a time. So, people consume different commodities at the same time. So, how are we going to calculate the utility derived out of those commodities which they are consuming together. So, for that we need to understand law of equi marginal utility, law of diminishing marginal utility will work only to understand the utility or you know derived out of the consumption of a single commodity 
but in real life consumer buys multiple commodities at the same time to satisfy their diverse wants right so for that we talk about law of equimarginal utility and law of equimarginal utility is basically the law which helps you how you are going to distribute your available income in the consumption of different commodities where the marginal utility which you are going to derive at the end from the consumption of different commodities will remain same right if you guys remember we have talked about the equimarginal principle right at that time also i have discussed with it, it with every one of you this law of equimarginal principle works in different aspects uh, if we talk about uh, from the consumer point of view then we look for the marginal utility which a consumer is driving out of the uh, you know distribution of income in the consumption of different commodities whereas from the producer side we have seen the marginal productivity derived out of the allocation of different activities or allocation of resources in different activities right so here as per the law of equi marginal utility marginal utility of all commodities should be equal suppose there is a commodity a b and c and a person has a given income right so how a person is going to uh, you know distribute his income for the consumption of these three commodities so that the marginal utility of good 1 should be equals to the marginal utility of good 2 should be equals to the marginal utility of all the goods which a person is consuming at the same time right so utility is the last unit consumed right utility from the last unit consumed is the marginal utility the last unit which you are going to consume for that commodity would be considered as an marginal utility and a rational consumer a person who behaves rationally will always try to maximize their total utility so that at the end they will be satisfied okay at the end they can say that they have distributed their income in a proportion where they are getting the equal satisfaction out of the consumption of each and every commodity right so this is how we understood this cardinal concept right where we have seen that utility can be measured in terms of utils for one commodity we have studied it through the law of diminishing marginal utility whereas for the multiple units because in real life consumer consume multiple units at the same time so this we have understood with the law of equi marginal utility how people can distribute their income to derive the maximum satisfaction where they need to calculate the marginal utility they are going to derive out of the consumption of different commodities should remain same at the end but for the practical reasons we can say that the concept given by elford marshall is not uh, applicable right it is very difficult like how much satisfaction if i am consuming any commodity and if if you will ask me what uh, number of utils or what define the uh, utils of the satisfaction you have derived out of the consumption of that commodity is really very difficult for me to tell right and for every one of us okay so this concept is not very much applicable and practical so because of that we have the another concept which is given by j r d hicks and r g d allen right according to them they says that utility cannot be measured in numbers utility cannot be measured in utils but we can only uh, give ordinal ranking to the consumption of commodities we are consuming we can rank them in order right if they are uh, two three products a b and c we can give the ranking that a is been preferred more than b or b is preferred more over c right we are uh, not able to tell exactly what kind of utility we are going to drive out of the consumption of these commodities but yes we can give our preferences we can give our choices right or we can give our ranking to it in terms of the order right that is why we call it as an ordinal utility and this concept is given by hicks and allen it is a team of an husband and wife they studied it and they they says that it is a more applicable way of calculating the utility okay so ordinal utility concept says that utility cannot be measured but can be ranked in comparison with one another okay we can only make a comparison right so modern economist holds that 
utility being a psychological phenomenon see this is the satisfaction which you are getting psychologically you cannot say anybody like this much of satisfaction you have received out of the consumption of that commodity yes definitely you can feel it right so that is why we can say that this is a psychological phenomenon cannot be measured quantitatively theoretically as well as conceptually and this way the measure of utility is ordinal rather than the cardinal and it is qualitative which is based on the ranking of preference for the commodities like for example suppose a person prefers tea to coffee and coffee to milk that means he or she uh, can subjectively tell that his or her preference would be tea over coffee and coffee over milk like i told you earlier we have seen the assumption of transitivity as well as completeness consumer are consistent and clear with their choices and whatever the choices they are making they are making it very clearly and they can give their ranking or preferences uh, on that basis right so indifference curve is basically defined as a locus of point on the graph each representing a different combination of two substitute goods so for understanding this ordinal concept we are talking about this indifference curve analysis where we are going to find out the combination of different commodities here we are not finding out the finding out utility in terms of utility utils but we are preferring our commodities what combination of commodities we are going to consume right so here we have substitute goods and we make a combination of these two goods which yields the same utility or the same level of satisfaction to the customer so the combination of goods gives the equal satisfaction suppose this is the curve here we have on the x axis uh, we have product x and we have on the y axis product y so here we have this indifference curve where we can use the different combinations of the commodities either we can have this much of x and this much of uh, sorry y and x and then again this is the combination we can use between these two commodities so all these points these are the points which we are defining right that these provides the equal kind of a satisfaction either we are talking about point a b c or d all these points are giving the same satisfaction to the consumer with the different combination of these two commodities where we have commodity x and commodity y right so therefore what we are saying the consumer is indifferent consumer is indifferent between any two combinations of these two goods when it comes to making a choice between them right a person can increase the choice or or the uh, you know commodity a over b or x over b but the satisfaction which they are going to derive out of the combination of those commodities will be same at the and so sometimes we also call this curve as an iso utility curve which means equal utility you are deriving with the combination of different commodity so this indifference curve can also be named as iso utility curve and iso means equal so again this is how we are representing this individual sorry indifference curve which is in short called as ic curve right see on the x axis we have here food and here we have clothes so we are using these different combinations of a b c and d we are choosing uh, of course any one combination but these are the points to make you understand so if we are increasing the consumption of clothes then definitely we are reducing our consumption of food because we have a given constraint that is of a budget that is of a income of a consumer right so with that given constraint you can choose the different combination if you are increasing one consumption of one commodity in that case you are decreasing the consumption of the another commodity right but you are keeping this into your consideration the satisfaction which you are going to derive out of the consumption of these two commodities will remain same so each point on the indifference curve represents a consumption basket having a combination of two commodities which a consumer is going to consume to understand this ic curve we have different properties of indifference curve and how this indifference curve work let us look at this so very first property says that indifference curve slopes downwards to the right which means that the slope of indifference curve will be downward and it will always be towards right why it happens because we are choosing the different combinations of the commodity and to have more of one commodity we are sacrificing the another 
definitely in terms of utility we are not making that sacrifice okay but yes to have more of one commodity we are reducing the consumption of another commodity so that is why this curve will always be downward sloping so what we are saying that it implies that curve has a negative slope and the property assumes uh, of non satiation which refers that the consumer is never satisfied and prefer to have more of goods to less of it right being a rational person being a uh, you know human being rather you can say we all are non satisfied people we always look for more and more and this is how we grow actually right so in different curves being downward sloping implies two things whereas follows either the two goods are substitute of each other or as quantity of one good increases the quantity of other good decreases so the consumer says that they stays at the same level of satisfaction okay so this is the very first property of indifference curve now looking at the second property we are saying that indifference curve will always be convex to the origin right this is the origin and this is the shape which we called it as an convex right if the shape of the curve would have been like this then we call it as an concave but this indifference curve is convex in the shape and this is because this uh, these two goods which we are representing on the x and the y axis known to have uh, their substitute of each other and because of this marginal rate of substitution because we are substituting one product with the another product so that is why the shape which we are going to get on the indifference curve will be of convex right so because x product has been substituted for the y product then the third property says that indifference curve cannot intersect each other now this is again important right you can see that indifference curve will always be parallel to each other but there will be a no chance where consumer is going to cut this curve and why this happens because of those assumptions which we have started earlier where we have seen that consumer is clear and consistent with their choices they have a clear understanding that if they are preferring a over b or b over a their preference will remain same or they will be indifferent among these two product their choices and their taste and preferences are not going to change anywhere in between and that is why these two curves will not uh, you know coincide with each other or they will not intersect with each other right so this implies only uh, one indifference curve can pass through a point in the indifference map if two commodities intersect each other which is impossible actually because we see that the two combination of good yields the different level of satisfaction or the two combination of goods will yield the same satisfaction right so we have that clarity that how we are making our choices and how we are clear with whatever the combination we are choosing we are going to go ahead with those combination to derive the maximum satisfaction out of it and that is why Uh, the the curves will never intersect with each other moving to the next uh, property of indifference curve we are saying that higher indifference curve will represent higher level of satisfaction that is again true the indifference curve these are the ic curves which are moving in the upper direction so here this is ic1 this is ic2 and this is ic3 so what does it means it means that higher our indifference curve will be because here we are having the combination of these two commodities and this much of quantity we can have for good x and for good y but yes of course if we move and take out the combination on ic2 then definitely more of these goods uh, will be there right so and as we have seen that consumers are non satisfied right they always look for more and more so their utility will be higher if they are consuming more of good x and more of good why so their combinations on the ic curve will give them higher utility as and when we move or draw the higher utility curve right so these are the most important properties of uh, in indifference curve and this indifference curve help us to understand the concept of ordinal utility given by ln and hex which says that utility cannot be measured in numbers but yes a uh, ranking can be given the preferences can be given keeping into consideration the total utility which we are deriving out of the consumption of these commodities now moving ahead we have special types of indifference curve these were the uh, properties which we have talked about the standard indifference curves but there are different situations there are different commodities available so we have 
some special categories of indifference curve. So, let us look at the first uh, category where we have the indifference curve for the goods which are perfect substitute of each other. Right. If the goods are perfect substitute of each other, in that case our indifference curve will be downward sloping, but this downward sloping curve will be a linear curve. Till now we have seen that indifference curve is in the form of a curve, but if two commodities say X and Y, right? we have two commodities X and Y and we are having uh, one unit of commodity X and we are having 10 units of commodity Y. Right, irrespective of the number we are consuming, but the satisfaction which we are getting out of the consumption of these two combination is, uh, you know, uh, the same satisfaction we are going to get if we are having one commodity X and if we are having 10 commodities of Y, but our, uh, you know, satisfaction will be same because these two are being considered to be a perfect substitute of each other. So, what we are saying, if we are increasing one commodity of uh, one unit of X and we are reducing two units of Y. Which, which makes it as a 8 and which increases up to 2. So, again uh, we are saying that we are substituting product x with the y or we are uh, substituting product x uh, y with the x by reducing the 2 units, but here the satisfaction which we are getting will be same. So, same case we are saying again if we want to add 1 unit to this x which makes it 3 and we reduces the 2 units of y which makes it number 6, right. So, you can see the sacrifice which you are making here is consistent, right, is every time 2 to increase 1 unit of x, you are always increasing the 2 units of y, right. So, here you can see the substitution is consistent and that is why this uh, indifference curve will be straight line, which is a linear downward sloping in case of perfect substitute, right. Earlier in this case also we are substituting uh, when we have talked about indifference curve, but they were not the perfect substitute. The, the substitution which we are doing were not, was not consistent, right. But here in this case we are substituting one commodity with the another commodity in a consistent manner. That is why the indifference curve shape will be linear and downward sloping. Moving ahead we have, uh, we can also draw this indifference curve for the perfect complement. If suppose the goods are perfect complements to each other and the complementary goods are those goods which creates a joint demand, right. So, for that the indifference curve will look like this which will be of right angled. Again we have the here on the x axis the right pair of shoe and we have here the left pair of shoe, right. If we have uh, equal number of right pair and left pair of shoes then only we will be able to satisfy if we have one pair of left shoe and we have two pair of left shoe uh, right shoe then the, the another pair of right shoe will be of no use because we do not have a uh, you know another pair of a left shoe okay so here if we are talking about uh, see uh, let me show you this clearly we have left shoe and we have right shoe if we have two pair of uh, two pair left shoes and we have two right shoes then this will give us say uh, the utility x okay but if we increase one left shoe and our right shoe numbers remains the same so our utility is going to increase no our utility still remain the same because this one pair of left shoe is of no use right even if we say that we have two pair of right shoes and we have increased one number of right shoe, again the utility here we are going to get is equal. The utility will only increase when we are going to increase both of them. Suppose we have added one shoe here for the left uh, and we have also added one shoe here for our right, right. So, then the utility will go up, otherwise it will remain same. So, in this case when the co products are complementary to each other are indifference curve would be of right angle, right. Then yes, uh, we have indifference curve for the bad situations also. Now, which conditions are being called as bad conditions? See, uh, we have different combinations of commodities, okay. Sometimes uh, you are going for something, suppose if you are going to talk about uh, starting a business, right, starting up a business with an objective of earning profit, yes. Okay, you, you start up the business activity and you start it up, you take all these uh, resources, you invest your capital with the objective of earning profit, but, but with that there is always a association of risk because it is always uncertain, it is always risky. There might be a possibility that you might earn losses rather than earning profit. 
so the effect and you are uh, you, you cannot make a choice between two right you have to go ahead with it right it is not possible that you only think of earning profit and you ignore uh, this uh, aspect of risk involved into it so that comes along with it okay so if you are planning to construct a dam right you 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 want to plan uh, or you want to construct a dam but for the construction of dam the kind of a pollution it is going to create that is something which we have to accept with it okay so those conditions are called as a bad conditions because they are always been associated with it and we cannot make a choice among any one of them so in that case our indifference curve will be uh, you know upward sloping because here this represents the bad conditions right where we, where they are saying that uh, we have to go ahead with the combinations of these two goods together and we cannot make a choice between one right so this is about your indifference curve where we have seen the properties what it is and what are the different situations and how this indifference curve will be drawn now moving to the next heading where we have consumers income right because it is again very important to understand the utility concept with the available income to the consumer right because whatever the uh, spending they are going to make whatever the budget they are going to make that is based on the income of a consumer so for consumer income we are going to understand here about the budget constraint the income which is given the resource which is limited and with that limited resource a consumer need to satisfy their maximum needs and wants okay so budget constraint includes the income of a consumer and the price of the commodities in the consumption basket because they these are the only two things which can affect the uh, demand of any commodity if the consumer is increasing then only they can increase their demand or if the price of commodity decreases right uh, in law of demand also we have studied uh, we have also talked about the reasons behind law of demand which was called as income effect here the income of a consumer is not increasing right keeping the same income of a person if a price of commodity decreases then also the purchasing power of a person increases so this budget uh, constraint is going to talk about two things one is the income of the consumer and the next is the prices of the commodity what effect it is going to create on the consumption basket so here with this graph we are trying to understand this this given line is basically the budget line okay this is the budget line of a consumer and this area is basically the area which is unaffordable because this is the income given right whatever a person can buy or whatever the combination a person can make for the consumption of different commodities can be made within this area okay this is affordable area okay different commodities you can ask at different combination of this area or at this point budget line also you can draw different combinations but beyond this line okay as because this is an unaffordable area you do not have uh, resources with you you do not have that much of income so you cannot make any combination beyond this point so for a consumer it is important for uh, them to understand how they are going to make their combination of different commodities based on that budget line now this budget lines also uh, shift upward it can shift downward also or there can be a movement which are called as swelling right so like i said budget line is constrained with the change in income and change in price of a consumer so it is very simple to understand whenever the income of a consumer changes definitely when the income will increase the budget line will shift towards right okay that will help you to increase your feasible area or the affordable area or you can consume more of the commodity and if the income of a consumer reduces then this budget line will shift backward okay so with the change in the income it is easy for you to understand that with the change in income if income increases the budget line will shift towards right and if the income decreases the budget line will shift towards left whereas if you talk about the change in prices how the change in price will affect this budget line right suppose the income remains the same but if the price of this y uh, you know and the price of this y commodity also remains same but the price of this x commodity reduces say for reason okay this price of x commodity reduces being uh, the income of a person same as well as the price of y commodity also uh, being the same but now you can see this consumer can demand more of this x commodity because the purchasing power has reduced uh, because of the reduction in the price of this 
commodity right so this this movement on the budget line would be known as swelling movement where a purchasing power of a person can also increase the consumption of that commodity keeping their income same right so i hope this shifts in budget lines are also clear to every one of you and then we have this consumer equilibrium right what is meant by consumer equilibrium at what point consumer is going to attain this equilibrium position right as we have already talked about the budget line so given constraint is uh, clear to all now let us look at this consumer equilibrium where we are saying that consumer equilibrium is at point where the budget line is tangent right tangent means where it is going to touch okay tangent means the point where it is going to touch the budget line to the highest attainable in difference curve by the consumer subject to the budget constraint right so budget constraint will always be there so how consumer is going to touch that uh, you know line and they will be able to get their maximum satisfaction so as we know that consumer behave rationally and will always aim to maximize their utility with the given money and the price of goods in the consumption basket so consumer will always try to utilize their uh, you know maximum satisfaction or to have the maximum satisfaction with the given income for the given price of the commodity so this is how we basically understand this consumer equilibrium you can see on the x axis we have good x and then we have good y and this is our budget line the straight line which is drawn here is called as the budget line of a person and this again is a feasible area uh, where you can make the different combinations of the commodity as well as on the budget line also you have different combination like for r s q t h these are the different points shown for the different combinations of the uh, product and these are the ic curves which are beyond this feasible area so as we have seen higher the ic curve higher will be the utility but the ic curve beyond the budget line will be of no use because you can't afford it right so here the consumer will be at equilibrium on this point q right because if you will either choose uh, like i said in the definition also if you are going to touch this budget line you are making the combination where you are able to touch this budget line there you will be able to get the maximum satisfaction but if you are going to choose this r point here you are having more of the uh, uh, good x but you are having the lesser of good uh, sorry you are having more of commodity y but you are having the lesser of good x with this point s also the same thing happening whereas for, uh, with these points t and h also you are having more of one commodity but a lesser of the another commodity but at the point q you can see that consumer is able to attain the maximum satisfaction because here the consumer is having a good combination of both the commodities given to a budget constraint so this q point would be considered to be the point of consumer equilibrium next we have this revealed preference theory and revealed preference theory is again based on the assumptions of completeness and transitivity as well as non satiation and this uh, theory is given by somelson and this theory is more real and more practical as compared to the previous two theories which we have talked about cardinal as well as ordinal concept given by marshall allen and hicks right so this theory says that it is much easier for the people to make their choices and to understand their behavior how people are behaving how they are reacting uh, with the choice of any commodity with this uh, graph you can understand it more clearly right where we have seen that consumer know their preferences and they have disclosed their preferences whatever may be the situation that if they are preferring product a over b and b over c they are going to prefer always a over c so here we have this money for good x and good y and this revealed preference theory also include the principle of uh, you know demand where we says that whenever the price of any commodity increases its demand decreases and this happens because of the substitutes available right people will shift their demand from the use of one commodity to the another commodity so here you can see the different combinations which a person can make for the consumption of a commodity by revealing their preferences so that's all for this session today if you are revising reviewing our session for today we have talked about the consumer choices then we have seen this utility concept of cardinal and ordinal how we can measure the utility 
right given to the consumer income how we can uh, you know plan out our budget and where we would be able to re reach our equilibrium point right so that we can have a better combination of the commodities where you could be able to satisfy your needs and wants to the maximum right and lastly we have talked about the reveal uh, preference theory which is uh, giving you a real and more practical implication of the uh, you know utility concept as compared to the cardinal and ordinal utility where a consumer is indifferent and clear and revealing their preferences in advance what choices and how they are going to make their choices is irrespective of their income and prices right so uh, further i can say that these are the reference books you can go ahead with for the subject uh, you know for for the uh, subject matter taken for this lecture these are the reference book and that's all for today's lecture thank you all of you